Hello, everyone. My name is Ingrid Valladares. I am Office Coordinator at AAAA Victoria. Welcome for joining us this morning. We hope you have your cup of tea or coffee ready and enjoy today's talk. Just a few words on the running order. After this, the main presentation will go for around 30 minutes. We'll then do a Q&A session moderated by Alistair Rob, our Executive Director, for 20 minutes, and then we'll do a Q&A session. And we'll finish at 9.30 a.m. We will be using the Q&A tab in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions in there or you can vote on questions that anyone else has asked. Today is the first webinar of our Women in International Affairs series, which is actually the second event in this series. Unfortunately, due to the current circumstances, we couldn't hold it in person this time, but this has allowed us to get us closer to overseas speakers that we wouldn't have been able to host before. On this occasion, we have the great pleasure to be joined by Karishma Vias, live from New York. Karishma is an Emmy and Peabody nominated Australian journalist and filmmaker, currently directing and producing documentaries as a US-based freelance reporter. She has covered conflicts across South and Southeast Asia for almost 20 years. Her reports and documentaries are widely featured on international media and she's also founder of Makara Pictures. She has won several international awards for her documentaries. And if you were able to watch ABC's foreign correspondent recently, The War on Afghan Woman and Behind Enemy Lines, a documentary where she covered the current situation in New York during this global pandemic, you would have been struck by her dedication to covering global issues. Karishma joins us today to discuss her career, its challenges and successes, her passion for covering untold stories that are contributing to raising public awareness on current global affairs. Now I'll hand over to Karishma, who is joining us live from New York. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you see me? <laughs> no, we can't see you yet, but now we okay, can see you. There I am. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for, um, you know, inviting me to this event. Um, I was really surprised um, to get the invitation and also really honoured. Um, and I was just listening to Ingrid, you know, go through her introduction of me. And I kind of found myself thinking, wow, this person sounds really interesting. I'd really like to meet her. Um, it sounds like they have a really interesting life. Um, and of course, like nobody thinks of their own life as being remotely interesting. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Melbourne. I went to Mount Waverley Secondary College. I did my high school there. And uh, to be honest, the most exciting thing to happen there was the <laughs> arrival of the German exchange student in year 11. Uh, that was the highlight of many of our, our high school adventures. Um, so I don't really think that I'm that much of an interesting person, but thanks to my career in international journalism, I've been fortunate to witness some incredibly interesting and profound moments in our history. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, so I wanted to start off just generally by talking about, you know, how I got my start in journalism. A lot of people, a lot of young um, journalists ask me that, you know, when I, when I meet them. So I want to take you back to the 26th of December, 2004. Um, I was sitting, I remember distinctly sitting on my balcony in Bangkok and I had treated myself that morning to a really decadent kind of breakfast, pastries and juice and I was, you know, just about to dig in when I received a call from my um, boss at Reuters News Agency and he was kind of talking vaguely. They had received some reports about something happening in the southern resort town of Phuket. And, you know, could I come in and just find out what was going on? Now, you have to understand that at this point, I was a 24-year-old lowly intern. I wasn't even staff. I had moved to Thailand two years before that, um, after literally just graduating from journalism school at RMIT and I had arrived, ended up in Thailand without any plan, without any job prospects, with very little money and I really didn't have much to show for my, for my initiative after two years um, and so I had talked my way into an internship at Reuters news agency there as a television producer 
And, and my plan, would you believe it, was to basically stay until they felt sorry for me and decided to pay me some money. Um, and so when I got that call on the 26th of December, at that point, I was four months into this internship with zero prospects of a job or them, you know, cutting me any kind of check. So anyway, I was very grumpy and feeling very exploited when I trudged into the office that morning. And 10 hours later, I found myself on a private chartered plane flying into Phuket into what can only be described as a absolutely like post-apocalyptic scene. I was amongst the first group of journalists to arrive in Phuket hours after a devastating tsunami had ravaged Thailand's southern coastline. We landed in the middle of the night uh, with no idea what to do, where to go. I remember a group of us had hired a car and we drove to the beach area and the scene I still can't believe was real. Um, we were driving past entire boats that were lodged into the second floor of a building. Um, there were cars turned upside down and scattered all over the road like toys. The only, you know, when it was the middle of the night, it was pitch black and there were no lights on, you know, the power had cut off, mobile phone signals were out. Um, and the only thing I remember I was carrying with me was my passport, a notepad and pen, my wallet and the clothes I was wearing. And that's what I lived in for the next three to four weeks as my colleagues and I covered, you know, did our best to cover the worst natural disaster, one of the worst natural disasters um, in the history of our world. Um, and so that's how I became a reporter, you know. Um, the unpleasant truth that every journalist knows is that for us to really thrive as reporters, the world has to suffer. If there were no wars, if there were no, no abuses, no disasters, most of us, the fact is, would be out of a job. And so for me, the 2004 Asian tsunami was the tragedy that really forged my career. After that, Reuters did give me a job. Um, and for the first time, I could call myself a journalist without feeling like a bit of a fake. Um, and, you know, that the work I did during that disaster led to postings later on in the Philippines, in India, in Malaysia, and now here in, in New York. Um, and all of this happened because at 7.59 a.m. on Boxing Day in 2004, a tsunami triggered by an earthquake killed almost 230,000 people across Southeast Asia. So it's hard in a way to be proud of a career when your greatest achievements are tied to mass human suffering. Um, some of my most celebrated stories have focused on the horrific domestic violence suffered by women in Afghanistan, the trafficking of Rohingya refugees into the sex trade, um, you know, and mo most recently, the deaths of thousands of people that we continue to witness here in New York because of the COVID pandemic. So this is something that I know I have a lot of difficulty reconciling myself with, and I know other reporters do as well. And, you know, you do increasingly find yourself asking, is it worth it? Does what I do make any kind of difference? Or am I just providing some kind of intellectual entertainment for people? Um, some days I'm still not sure of what the answer is to those questions, but, you know, it's, it's the only job that I can do. It's the only job that I've ever felt drawn to do and, and to feel, you know, passionate about doing um, again and again. And, you know, this career has lasted 20 years so far. When I started as a young reporter in Melbourne, um, there was this kind of 
unspoken understanding that being a woman in this industry is a liability, even though the vast majority of my, you know, fellow journalism students were, were also women. Um, and this impression, and it, you know, I really kind of got this impression during my week-long internships at ABC TV News, as well as John Fain's radio program, which is still running, I hear, God bless him. <laughs> um, and I could see, you know, by kind of observing the office around me, um, I could see that in this world of journalism, female reporters were very much kind of orbiting around the men in this field. Um, if you wanted to fit in, if you wanted to get ahead, you would have to fit into their world in a way. It's a really obscure thing to nail down. Um, even, you know, for me, having been in this industry for so long, but all I can tell you is that, you know, men very much were at the centre of this industry. They, and I, I'm talking in the past tense, but actually it applies equally to the present. You know, men by, you know, are major, hold the majority of editorial positions, they're presenters, they're the managing directors. And women, with very few exceptions, kind of revolve around them as the, you know, often the support staff. Um, and I know it sounds like a, like a cliche, but, you know, cliches become cliches for a reason. It's because they, they you know, refer to cultural norms. Um, and so, you know, this culture was and continues to be very pervasive. And for me, as a kind of a, brown immigrant girl from the suburbs. I existed very much in the far, you know, flung corner of this solar system. I was basically Pluto, as far away from the center of power as, as you could really get. Um, and so right after university, I left Australia to find a different solar system to exist in, to try and make my mark on. Um, and I always thought, you know, I, I always really believed that, at, you know, at some stage I would come back to Australia um, because things would be different, you know, um, things would evolve very quickly and, and, you know, there would be a space for, for reporters like me. Um, but sadly, it, things haven't changed that much. You know, a survey published in 2000 and 13 showed that although women made up 55.5% of Australian journalists, only 30% of senior managers were women. Um, and so what that tells me is that while the industry is very happy for us to be the foot soldiers, kind of, you know, straight out of university, fresh faced, going out there doing the hard work of field reporting, um, when it came to promotions and equal pay, and a progression in your career, it was, it was a different matter. Um, and the same study also showed that at every editorial level from, you know, your rank and file junior reporters to then your junior managers and senior managers, even if you made it up through those ranks, the only thing you could really look forward to was a lower salary than your male counterparts. Now, I don't want to pick on Australia. This is not just a problem in Australia. Um, you know, one of the most high profile examples of this recently was um, Kerry Gracie. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that name, but she was a very celebrated, very senior journalist at the BBC. Um, extremely uh, experienced in, in, you know, covering China. Um, she'd done it for years. She had really, you know, made the BBC proud um, in terms of her achievements. In 2018, um, she was the, you know, she resigned from the BBC after she discovered that she was being paid substantially less than her male counterpart. And by substantially less, I mean £100,000 less for doing 
you know, the same kind of work that, that her male colleagues were doing. She took the BBC to court and she won. Um, and she very graciously donated all the back pay that she received to an organisation fighting um, for pay equality. I mean, it's a, it's a very commendable thing that she did, but the fact that she had to fight for that and the fact that she, you know, in the end, it wasn't even about money for her, I think says a lot about how, you know, female reporters are valued um, in our industry. So, you know, all of these things were kind of swirling around in my head at that point, you know, 2017, 2018. And I was, you know, across the Atlantic, I was already living in New York by then. Um, and here, I really had a kind of a front row seat to another gender war that was unfolding very rapidly. And you will be familiar with this. It was, of course, the sexual assault allegations against Harvey Weinstein. And that, you know, it was such a huge story and, and still remains such a huge story. Um, because it, of course, triggered the Me Too movement, which opened an entire Pandora's box on the terrible way women are marginalised and abused in the workplace. And what that scandal really made clear was that, you know, these, these kind of instances that we had been hearing for many years about, you know, gender inequality and sexual harassment and, and the glass ceiling, you know, we had kind of heard a trickling of stories related to this. And what this movement did was basically break the dam. And it became very apparent very quickly that these were not isolated cases that, um, women's place in the workplace was a issue that touched all of us in one way or the other. Um, I know that for many women seeing, you know, reading about, hearing about the Me Too movement, sharing their stories was an incredibly empowering experience. And I can see how that would be the case for me it had exactly the opposite effect. I have been very fortunate in that I have not experienced sexual harassment or abuse in the workplace. Um, but hearing these stories en masse really shook me personally because what it did was confirm my worst fears and my worst suspicions that no matter how hard I worked, no matter how good I was, um, I was always going to be on the outside of this industry because I was a woman. I was always going to be on the far edge of this, of any solar system I went to, you know, and that it really didn't, you know, it was, it was easier believing that if I tried harder, if I worked harder, if I did better, then I could move up in this industry and, and get, op, you know, different opportunities. It's a lot more difficult to accept that no matter what you do, that that's not going to happen. Um, and so, to be honest, I started very seriously after almost 20 years in the industry, I started seriously considering going back to school, going back to university, and retraining to do something else. Um, and, I, and I was, you know, mentally preparing myself to do that. And it was, it was devastating because this is an industry, I had never pictured doing anything else. You know, I had wanted to be a journalist since I was like, I think, 12 years old or something. Um, and so I was kind of working, you know, working my way to do that, 
when I received a call from my editor at Al Jazeera and she asked me to go to Bangladesh and do a story on the Rohingya refugee crisis over there. Um, you'll recall that um, in late 2017, there was a mass exodus of uh, more than 700,000 Muslim Rohingya villagers um, who were fleeing genocide in Myanmar and had essentially, and, and within you know, weeks, um, they had set up the world's largest refugee settlement in, in Bangladesh, close to the border with Myanmar. It was a, it was a harrowing story um, at the time. And so I went and I started to investigate a story about how young Rohingya girls um, are being trafficked into Bangladesh's sex trade. It was just an absolutely awful story because what we found was that this kind of network of men and women were essentially waiting for these refugees and were looking at targeting the most vulnerable refugees, you know, families who had like the male head of the family had been murdered and there was only the wife and the young children, um, you know, and therefore they had no kind of protection, nobody to look out for them in that male dominated society. And they would target these young girls, children, many of them, and traffic them into the sex trade under the guise of providing jobs or security or a, or a home to live in. Um, and as I was reporting this, it occurred to me that if I was a man, I would never be able to tell this story. The girls would never talk to me. And I realized that even though I may not be welcome into boardrooms or I may never um, be promoted to an editor. I was being invited into living rooms, into kitchens, into refugee tents and shelters all over the world because I'm a woman. Um, and as a reporter, those rooms are the rooms that I really need to be in. Um, and I kind of started feeling quite sorry for my male colleagues because of my unfair advantage. Um, you know, the fact that I was getting all these stories, that I was getting all this access, that people were willing, men and women were willing to talk to me um, about, you know, these these incredibly, for them, for what they considered to be incredibly shameful experiences, they were only doing that because they felt far more comfortable speaking to a woman than they would ever have felt comfortable speaking with a man about this. So, you know, from countries from like the Middle East, Afghanistan, and even in the West, there is an entire world that women inhabit. Um, that men simply can't get access to. And for a reporter, that's just death. I mean, as a reporter, you are only as good as the access people give you. You know, you're only as good as the stories that you're allowed to tell by the people who, who own those stories. And so, you know, not to be able to, like in countries like Afghanistan, which I've covered for 13 years, men cannot be in the same room with women, let alone question them about their private lives and about you know, what they've gone through and what they've experienced. And so you know, newsrooms in Kabul are full of male reporters, but they cannot report, they cannot do stories on 50% of that country's population. Um, and that is just appalling. And, and it is a constant source of frustration for my male colleagues over there. Whereas I can kind of 
you know, I don't want to say waltz in, but I can certainly, you know, go in. And that's, that's never an issue for me. Because in a country like Afghanistan, being a foreign woman, you're kind of almost like a third gender, you know, you're accepted by the women, you're welcomed by the women. Um, and, you know, you share a kind of a camaraderie with them. But also the men in that society, they, you know, different rules apply to you when you're a foreign woman than, than an Afghan woman. They are curious about you because they can suddenly be in a room with a woman without it being, you know, incredibly taboo. You're there as a reporter. Um, they accept you as, as being, some, you know, a professional and therefore they will share their stories. You know, they would never do that with an Afghan. You know, they would never dream of speaking so openly and freely with an Afghan woman. And so, you know, you walk, you walk this strange line where, you know, in, in countries like this, you almost have no gender. You, you are a universal gender. Um, and that is a privilege that men, male reporters simply don't have. And I don't know if they'll really ever have. Um, and so, you know, after kind of being on the brink uh, in, in, at the end of 2017 of, of kind of walking away from this, prof this profession, I, I found myself just diving head first into it again. Um, and shameless, quite, I'm not afraid to say, quite shamelessly exploiting all the benefits that come with being a woman in this industry. Um, because, you know, while, yes, there are all of these problems of the glass ceiling and pay inequality um, and all the myriad of other problems that this industry has, I know that as a woman, I can talk my way into and often out of almost anything. Um, and I can convince almost anybody to, you know, tell me their story. And there is, there is no more power, there's nothing more powerful than that as a reporter, because that is ultimately the only thing that, that you have is, is other people's stories. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to just kind of share that experience, you know, share that kind of evolution of, of my journey with you um, and give you a little bit, I guess, a little bit of a backstory to all the things that, that kind of go through your mind when you're out there reporting, you know, reporting in the world. Um, I kind of prefer to have more interaction with people, find out what you're, you know, uh, interested in, in learning about in terms of my career and my field, um, which, is, which is international reporting. So I could um, throw it back. I think at this point, I'll throw it back to Melbourne to see if um, anybody's interested in, in any questions. Absolutely. Uh, Karishma, that, that was just inspiring. It's absolutely hitting the spot from our perspective for what we were trying to achieve with this Women in International Affairs series. Uh, for anyone who's joined since the, the intro at the beginning, my name's Alistair Roth. I'm the Executive Director at AWI Victoria and with my colleague Ingrid, who had the idea of putting us all together. So I will just um, moderate the Q&A and, and pitch him across to, to Karishma. So I'm, I'm just going to start with one. Well, it was sort of a comment in a way, um, but it, it, it's, it's complimentary. What, what you're doing makes a huge difference, uh, despite the fact that it mostly involves or often involves reporting very unpleasant issues, as, as you said. Um, you, you've obviously got a, an absolute focus on raising public awareness of, of global issues. Um, how, how do you deal with, with a lot of the suffering that, that you see? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult, actually. And, you know, my first um, foray into real reporting, as I mentioned, was the tsunami. And I, rem I was just, you, we were so surrounded by unspeakable tragedy at that point. And 
I remember just sitting, being so quite overwhelmed at one point and having to just like sit, sit down. I was, I was in the field reporting and people, it was at the time when people were searching for their family members, everybody was lost, you know, it was absolute mayhem and people were looking for their wives and their children and all of that. And I just found it so overwhelming. And I remember just sitting there and I just said to myself, I don't have the right to, f to their pain um, because it wasn't something that was happening to me. It wasn't something that was happening to my family member at that time. And so I didn't have the right to just throw my hands up and say, this is too awful. I can't deal with this. You know, they had the right to what they were feeling, to their pain. And the only thing that I could do was the thing that I knew how to do best was to tell their story and hope that, you know, by telling their story, that more aid would come to, to that place, more volunteers, more experts would come to help these people find their family members or, you know, to identify, you know, forensic experts would come to identify their bodies. So that's something, to be honest, that I've taken with me since that time is that whenever I'm confronted with something that I find overwhelming, I just remind myself that I don't have the right to feel what they feel because it isn't, it isn't my experience that I'm living through. Yeah, that's right. The, um, the, the reason that we actually tracked you down a few weeks ago was having watched um, the ABC foreign correspondent program on um, Afghanistan when you were there. And I, I know from my own experience, having traveled briefly in Afghanistan about 15 years ago, the, the, the challenges and, and the, 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 the risks there. Um, there's a question, just I suppose on the logistics of going to someone like that, how, how do you actually go about the question actually was, do you speak any other languages or, or do you have to rely on an interpreter? But how, how do you go about just, just sort of getting out and finding the story and, and then moving around somewhere that's that risky? Yeah, so I speak um, Hindi um, because, you know, I, I come from an Indian heritage. Um, and so I speak Hindi, and which is also very similar to Urdu, so I can understand and kind of get by in Urdu. But in Afghanistan, of course, you know, they, they speak Dari and Pashtu, which might share some similar words, but not that many. I work with a, a very trusted, excellent local producer and he and you know i trust him to give us advice on you know which areas in kabul we can go to which areas we can't go to um he arranges security for us as well um very trusted driver um as well as a security person who shadows us when especially you know wherever we go but especially when we're filming out on the street um, I've been going to Afghanistan for 13 years. So now I've, you know, become quite familiar with a lot of the people and the places. Um, but that situation changes so quickly. And even if I go to Afghanistan, like last year, I went there twice. I did two documentaries. They're almost back to back. But I have to remind myself that I can't take any knowledge for granted, especially security, you know, just because things were, it was okay to do this one thing or film in this one place a month ago, doesn't mean that it's, it's okay now. So, you know, we're con I'm, I'm constantly relying on um, the locals that I work with to, to keep us alive, basically. And they, they had their, our, ha our lives in their hands, you know. Absolutely. There are, there are clearly some uh, budding journalists watching this because we're getting various questions as we, we hope we might as to what advice do you have for anyone who's studying journalism or, or anything else for that matter? How do you go about breaking in? Is it still the case you can go and sort of talk yourself into an internship or it, and, and just a separate one is, is there anyone sort of mentoring uh, young people to do this? Yeah, um, it's the industry has changed so dramatically since I had graduated university. Like now, the real growth area is in digital journalism. You know, every job I see posted is about digital producers and, and being able to, you know, 
have those skills to to interact with audiences via social media and things like that so that's a real growth area and that's something that i mean i, I think as a young reporter should really focus on there are so many different types of journalism like there have never been more even though the industry is shrinking i feel like it's a bit of a dichotomy because there's never been more avenues to be a reporter podcast i mean when i graduated everyone was saying radio was going to die like it was dying this slow but you know sure death and now you've seen this resurgence of podcasts and actually if there's one media that i consume the most it is podcasts um i i listen to them more than i watch television or documentaries or anything because it's so accessible and versatile um so i would really look at all of these growth industries as a young reporter and they don't take much television is a very investment heavy medium you know you need a cameraman or you be your own cameraman if you are going you need to invest in equipment it's very very expensive if you look at podcasts if you look at digital um you know print it requires zero investment it just requires initiative and so you've got to you've got to really bring that initiative um but you can you can make it work you know so i would really look at these growth industries as a as a young reporter and you, you describe yourself, Krishna, as, as well, journalist and filmmaker. I mean, how, has that been a, a, a natural progression or you, you've evolved to, I mean, I am guess I'm asking the, the difference between the reporting and then the filmmaking side. Yeah, so, you know, the best thing about journalism, I have to say, is it's one of those professions where you are constantly learning, you know, just because you you know, pass out of university, just because you've been in the industry for 20 years, it, it really doesn't mean that, you know, that's it, you've, you're done, you've made it, you know everything there is to know about reporting. Um, and so for me, I really, even though I had worked in the early phase of my career, very much in breaking news, you know, working for the wire service, and, um, and then, you know, I've reported as a television reporter for AFP and Al Jazeera, I began to realize that I actually didn't enjoy news that much. You know, I didn't enjoy the, the kind of constantly fast, rapid paced evolution of, of news and having to constantly, you know, churn out news. There are, there are friends of mine, reporters, who live for that stuff, absolutely love it. You know, it gets the adrenaline going. They just can't get enough of it. I'm not one of them. And so, you know, slowly I realized that I was kind of, that I was the kind of reporter that liked to delve deeply into stories, that liked to take a little bit of time to find out exactly what was going on, you know, who I should be speaking to, learn about their background, learn about who they are as people. And then the filmmaking side of it is, you know, there's a reason we call in journalism, we call our work stories. They had, they're not just a collection of facts that, you know, you list one after the other. And so I started really moving into telling a narrative, telling us like a story, you know, like children, you read bedtime stories to children. Well, adults like, like stories as well. Um, and so you have to create, it's a very creative process um, that you, you know, you give your audience the chance to delve into somebody else's world into somebody else's mind and there's a whole other set of skills that go into learning how to do that so that's kind of where you know that's where my journey is at the moment there's another question but um as a freelance how do you go about finding your stories and, and do you need to go and look for sponsorship to to, to give you the yeah. work to chase it it's it's really difficult i have to say like i'm not going to recommend that anyone be a freelancer, although, you know, as a freelancer, I, it has afforded me the opportunity to work on stories that I'm personally very passionate about. Um, and that is like a huge bonus, um, you know, to, to any career is just to have the luxury to work on stories that you really, really want to. The way I come up with story ideas is I read, you know, as a freelancer, people, 
people think you're kind of, you spend half your life on vacation and then the other half, like, well, a third of your life working and then two thirds of it on vacation. That's not, has, that's never been my approach. I, you know, even when I don't have anything commissioned, I do basically my nine to five um, at home. I'll, I'll get up every day. I'll read, I'll just constantly be reading about what's happening in all parts of the world, anything that's interesting to me. And through that process, you know, I'll, I'll come across stories that I think, oh, wow, this would make a really interesting television story or a documentary. And then I'll go about pitching that to clients. And, you know, in fairness, the vast majority of stories that you pitch don't get picked up for various reasons, for reasons sometimes that I don't understand. Um, and you, so it's, it again, you just have to be, a, get accustomed to that rejection, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's not because your story idea was bad or whatever, it could be a million reasons, but then you just have to kind of dust yourself off and start again until, you know, you come up, you do pitch a story that gets accepted. At the, the introduction, we, we mentioned that you've been nominated for an Emmy and a, and a Peabody. And of course, you won two Walkley Awards in 2018, which would be more familiar, I suppose, to our Australian audience. But um, do you find with, with those on your, your resume, people are coming knocking on the door? I mean, it must count for quite a bit in your world. No, honestly, like in, in the journalism business, you know, everybody knows you're only as good as your last story. And to be honest, now, not even that, <laughs> you know, um, now it's kind of like you, you just, you can't rest on your laurels in this industry. Um, it's shrinking too fast. There's too much competition for the work that is out there. And so while it's a nice pat on the back to get um, recognition in that way, you, you really do start from scratch every time, you know, every time you, you pitch a story. You, you'd mentioned too that um, you, you, can, you can talk your way into and out of anything as a woman, but there are a couple of people saying, you know, are, there, are there any times that you think, oh, you know, I wish I wasn't here or some, some moment that's, that's been particularly um, scary or that you've, you've sort of had yeah. to rethink? I mean, there are plenty of things, you know, when you're, when you're, a reporter and especially when you're a reporter in foreign countries in places you don't speak the language don't know the language um, there are many many things that go wrong <laughs> all the time that's just a fact of life I mean and the way I prepare for I you know the way I deal with that is really trying to prepare ahead of time for every eventuality so that when things do go wrong um, sometimes I have a plan in place already. Um, sometimes because of the preparation I've done, I'm able to mitigate some of the things that go wrong. Um, and then sometimes there's just nothing you can do, but because you've, you know, had your preparation, you can then have the brain space to deal with uh, other things. I mean, I can, I can give you so many examples. When I did that story at the Rohingya refugee camp, um, inexplicably, we attracted the attention of, um, of the security intelligence services in Bangladesh. And it was very problematic because we were speaking to these very vulnerable young women and, and families about how they were being trafficked and all of that. And of course, the Bangladeshi government did not necessarily want the world to know that these refugees that they were supposedly taking care of were being trafficked, you know, um, out of these camps. So it was, you know, and we had men, groups of men, intelligence officers in plain clothes following us around the entire day for many days. Um, and that jeopardized the safety and security of the people that were speaking to us because they would be visited by these intelligence officers after we had been there. Um, and so it was really quite difficult. We had to 
play this game of crazy cat and mouse where you know every day we would need to change cars and drivers every day we would need to leave and return at a different time from the hotel in in order to kind of avoid detection we would have to if we saw some of them you know we began to recognize them by face if we saw some of them coming towards us in the camps we would have to hide and it was ridiculous because it had nothing to do with the story that we were there to report on but you know it is it is what it is um another time you know one of the times we were uh the two stories we did in afghanistan last year one was with the red cross and while we were filming there the taliban decided that they were not going to protect the red cross anymore and you know so we didn't know what does that mean does that mean that there is an imminent attack that is being planned for the you know the medical facility that we were filming in um and you know at the same time the taliban uh, launched a massive attack on the Ministry of Information, which was across the road from our hotel where we were staying. And um, there was a day long firefight, you know, which basically across the street from us. Um, and our hotel had also been targeted several times in the past. So all of these things happen and there's just no way you can plan for it. No way you can prepare for it you just have to try and do the smart thing in that moment um, and make a call and hope hope for the best sorry i just lost my button there um there, there's a quote i mean i don't know have you have you had a a favorite posting as one of the questions um, all, um I don't know, like every, every country I've been to, you know, I've been posted to the Philippines to, um, you know, I was in Bangkok and then Philippines and then India for eight years and then Malaysia and now in New York, every posting has its benefits. I mean, I have to say being in India, I was there the longest. Um, it was, it was <laughs> the posting I hated the most. And it was also the posting I loved the most. Um, you know, it, it's such a vivid country. It's such a diverse country. So many things happening. It was also the place where, you know, I mean, Afghanistan is, remains one of my favorite places to report from. Um, it is such a visual place. Um, the culture is so strong. The characters, the people you meet there are so they leave such, leave such an impression on you, you know, because, I mean, this is a country that has suffered 40 years of relentless conflict. And if that's not going to give you nerves of steel, I don't know what will. And so the people you meet there are so distinctive um, that, you, you know, I just, I just feel a great um, passion for them and passion for telling their stories. So it, it is the hard, I, I think for me, I don't know what this says about me, but often the places that are the most difficult end up being my favorite places to, to work in. I don't know why. Every time I go there, I come back with a lot more gray hair and, and I just think I'm never doing this again. And then of course, the minute your plane takes off, you're kind of planning your next story over there. Of, of course, the, the, the foreign correspondent program that aired a couple of weeks ago was you reporting for close to home in New York on, on COVID. I mean, how, how was that? How, how are you doing there? Because we read all sorts of, you know, worrying headlines about New York and, and just putting yourself into that environment seems, I mean, brave. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it was brave or just silly. Like, I think, um, to be honest, my risk, I, my risk standards are probably a lot lower than most people, you know, because I've been covering places like Afghanistan and other conflicts for so long. Um, you know, I, I think my approach to a lot of these stories is I understand, I make sure I understand the risk. I make sure that I'm taking it seriously. I'm not being flippant about it and if and you know as an extension of that I take the precautions that are within my power to take 
um, for not just me, but for my team, because usually, you know, I'm responsible for other people. You know, I've brought in the cameraman to work with me. I've brought in um, the local producer, you know, to work with me. And so I want to make sure that I've done everything that I can. Well, firstly, I want to make sure that they understand what the risks are that they're, you know, taking on. And that at the same time, I've done everything I can to protect them as much as I can and myself. And, and then we just have to wait and see. So, you know, in, in terms of this, it was a totally different type of risk that we obviously took. It was ever present um, and it was invisible. And so we took some pretty extreme measures in terms of avoiding, you know, contaminating ourselves. We always wore masks um, and gloves uh, to, to, you know, make sure we didn't touch our face Every night I would disinfect the car. We would disinfect everything, all the equipment, everything we carried with us would be, you know, wiped down at the end of the day. And we, we, I had to move in with the cameraman, you know, to make sure that we didn't go home and, and inadvertently infect our family. So we lived together for the course of the filming and also for two weeks for the 14 days quarantine after we finished filming. So I've only been home since last Friday. Actually, I was able to finally come home after making sure that, you know, during the quarantine, we didn't fall sick. Are there, is there anything that, um, any stories that you'd like to go and cover or you, you possibly can't talk about current projects? I don't know, but um, yeah, any, no. any, any new countries or new issues you'd like to go and get stuck into? Yeah, like there's a whole world out there, you know, like everything. I'd like, I'd go anywhere, anytime kind of thing. I mean, the Middle East is one that I haven't had the opportunity to cover. And that, of course, has been a major, you know, so many stories coming out of there over the last um, five, six, seven years. Um, so that's a real, that's a spot that I really you know hope to have the opportunity to cover sometime in the future um there's so many interesting things happening in south america like now being based in the us you know venezuela has has just been this you know slow burning story that unfortunately doesn't get a lot of coverage but is is you know incredibly important so so many stories africa often you know the entire continent so diverse so many things happening there on the security front on human rights you know issues um again a region that doesn't get as much coverage as it should um so yeah i this is this is the great thing about journalism you're never gonna not have a story to cover you know there's always something happening out there you know, many places. Yeah. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, it was World Press Day. Um, are, are, there any, are there any changes you'd like to see in international reporting or, or transparency in journalism? We had a question on that. Yeah, you know, um, I think if there's one thing that I would like to see is really local reporters getting the kind of recognition and the kind of opportunities that they should be getting. Um, you know, foreign correspondents in the past, like, of course, have come from uh, wealthier nations and they have gone to countries and reported on stories to explain that country back to their home audiences. We don't live in that world anymore with, um, you know, access to kind of the internet and, and television and all of that happening in, in a lot of countries. We don't need foreign correspondents explaining a country to that country's population. We need reporters from those countries reporting on their own communities, you know, because they, they live there, they breathe the issues that they're covering, it affects them, it affects their families. And so who better to cover, you know, cover these stories. And I was really happy today, the Pulitzers, the Pulitzer winners were announced today. 
and I saw that for photography, the Associated Press took out the Pulitzer for photography and it was their local photographers based in Kashmir that picked up, you know, that award. And, and I know those guys, I've covered Kashmir, I've been in India, in Delhi for eight years and, um, you know, no worthier people could have received that award. So I, I really am happy to see so many local reporters kind of finally getting the recognition that they deserve. But I think that recognition needs to be coupled with opportunity in the future, you know. Absolutely. That's, that's really just timely on the Pulitzers. Um, we're sort of heading to the end and maybe we just do, do one, one or two more questions. But um, Do you see yourself um, staying as a freelance or can you, or would you like to be a newspaper executive was the question. <laughs> no, to be honest, I don't want to be a newspaper executive. It's, it, to be honest, it sounds quite boring. I'd rather be out in the field and reporting. Um, I think for me, it was never really about being a freelancer versus a full-time job. It was always about what I would have the opportunity to cover in both those, you know, as, as either a freelancer or as a, as a full-time employee. And the reason I, I became a freelancer was because I had, a, I had a very set idea of what I wanted to do. I wanted to start working, you know, get away from the kind of news cycle and report more on, on, longer stories, do long form. And that's why I became a freelancer. And so if I am given, if I find an organization, and now these days with Netflix and, you know, so many avenues here in the US to do that kind of work, I'd be more than happy if I find a job like that, that allows me to continue doing, doing that. I'd be more than happy to kind of hang up my freelance boots and you know become become staff somewhere but it's all it's all about what the job is rather than you know anything else excellent well i think that um that is pretty much bringing us to the end of our allotted hour um we're aware mm -hmm. it's evening in new york and it's it's the start of our day here in melbourne but um Carisha, just just looking at some of the comments that have come apart from the questions um the word inspiring has come up several times and, and indeed it absolutely has been inspiring to to hear from you you were you were far too modest at the beginning i think on your, on your achievements and i think you've inspired an, another uh, a, a new generation of um journalism hopefuls uh looking at some of the comments so um, and from our perspective, we, we started this Women in International Affairs series to, to celebrate the, the achievement of women in the international arena and to be able to reflect critically on barriers women face and, and just to meet extraordinary women doing extraordinary things. Um, absolutely, you have covered that ground completely and we're so grateful you've taken the time to, to join us. Um, we'll be doing more webinars, but uh, so great to have you on. Thank you from Ingrid and myself. Um, please stay safe in New York. Come and visit us in Melbourne when you come back. And yeah, I would love to. Watching. Love to <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, one day when we can get out of lockdown, if you're here, we'll, we'd love to host you for a one-on-one -on -one and people can come and chat to you afterwards, have a glass of wine, and get some more tips. But um, everyone watching at home, uh, stay safe. We'll see you again. And Karishma, Thank you again so much for your time. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed that actually. And my only regret is that, yeah, we couldn't do it in person. I would have loved to have seen people's faces and yes. chatted to them and, and things like that. But you know, one day we'll get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Well, keep, keep doing a, a great job and, and stay well. Okay, thank you. Thank have, you. A, have a good day. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Bye.